everyone, and including some of my colleagues at the University of California, who I mentioned this to. And we have an extraordinary number of people here. Uh, and for the people that are not familiar with this meeting, normally we hold this once a month on topics related to NMR. So to get started, let me uh, turn the things over to our sponsor, John Webb, who will welcome everyone. Well, thank you, Dave, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you may be, and uh, welcome to uh, uh, yet another uh, monthly Ivan meeting. As uh, Dave mentioned, uh, very good attendance. I see uh, looks like 264 and uh, possibly uh, more to come. Th thank you very much, uh, everyone, for uh, joining us uh, today. Uh, very important topic that will uh, be presented and uh, discussed, uh, the uh, liquid helium situation that uh, uh, is uh, affecting uh, many, if not uh, uh, most of us uh, in the industry. Uh, MR Resources and uh, Q1 Instruments are uh, very happy to uh, uh, be bringing these meetings to you. Uh, MR Resources, of course, have uh, been around since uh, uh, 1985 and uh, providing uh, a very good line of uh, reconditioned NMR spectrometers. Uh, in fact, uh, they have on hand for immediate delivery uh, a number of Avance 3, 400, 500, 600, and 700 systems, uh, also providing uh, uh, service contracts, uh, quench recovery uh, service, and uh, moving and uh, uh, relocation. Uh, that said, uh, now a, a brief word on uh, Q1 Instruments. Uh, Eric, if you uh, would, please. We invite you to get to know Q1. Q1 designs and manufactures NMR spectrometers from 400 to 600 megahertz with features for routine use and the research laboratory. Want to upgrade an older system without blowing your budget? Q1 can retrofit AS and UltraShield magnets with complete upgrades, including automation, for less than you think. Q1 offers NMR instruments with excellent performance at an unbeatable price. Experts know the key to performance is the probe, and Q1 offers smart tune and match probe made by Q1 Tech. Q1 Tech has decades of experience and leads the market in innovation. Q1 STM probes have a patented hybrid tuning mechanism, which means faster tuning for improved throughput and unmatched reliability. Q1 offers their 400 MHz instrument with STM probes in three configurations. A two-channel probe with fluorine tuning on both X and H channels for maximum flexibility or fluorine detection can be isolated to the X or H channel to maximize H sensitivity or to maximize carbon and phosphorus sensitivity. Q1 Tech STM probes are also integrated into Topspin and VNMRJ for improved performance and throughput for existing installations. Want to know more? Our websites have additional info. We're also happy to provide remote demonstrations with your samples. Please contact us by phone or email. Th thank you, Eric. And uh, Chris, over to you. Could you uh, give us uh, uh, some insight on uh, upcoming uh, Ivan meetings, please? Um, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, we have um, um, Michael Raybach from Merck. Uh, thanks to him that he was originally scheduled in May and because of this helium crisis, he graciously ag agreed to move that to June and the panelists uh, in June, on June 23rd, we have a molecular confirmation by INMR by Mikhail Redark at Merck, and he will be joined by Amber Balas from AstraZeneca, Donovan Atressa from uh, Lapsa Oncology at uh, Lilly, and Thomas Williamson from University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And following that, uh, we have in July, we have uh, Jacqueline Thomas from Procter & Gamble uh, leading a discussion on polymer NMR. And uh, we have a couple of uh, August and September, we are still working on scheduling, um, finalizing a schedule. And But in October, uh, we have um, uh, Tim Claridge from Oxford University um, uh, leading a discussion on NOVA sequences. That will be in October, but uh, stay tuned for August and September, something will come up very soon uh, in our website. Uh, with that, I will 
uh, we'll give back to John for um, further comments. Th thank you very much, Chris. A uh, very good lineup of uh, continuing uh, monthly meetings. Uh, and uh, now to uh, get things started, uh, Dave Rice, if uh, you could uh, make the uh, introductions, uh, please. For those who haven't usually been here, um, our format will be to um, to first listen to our speakers, and which Ken will introduce in just a moment. And uh, I think that this meeting will probably go on for quite a long time. Um, we'll have a lot to say. So we don't really have any time limits uh, as long as everything is interesting. So with, without further ado, let me hand this over to our panel leader, Ken Knott, who has arranged the speakers. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I think an indication of the importance of this topic today is uh, the fact that we have uh, e easily double the attendees we uh, have ever had for an Ivan meeting. And I think we've had registrations approaching 500 people. Um, this meeting today is going to be two parts. Uh, part one will be led by or, or introduced by Phil Kornbluth from uh, Kornbluth Consulting, and he's going to give us an update on the current status of the crisis, as well as kind of how we got here and uh, the, the implications in both the short and longer term. Uh, hopefully he'll have some good news for us. And he's going to be followed with uh, Craig Bettenhausen from CNE News and uh, Nancy Washington, an NMR scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Labs. Uh, following those uh, panel leaders, we'll have a little bit of discussion among, amongst the panel leaders and we'll, or we'll invite questions from the audience. And then we'll move into part two, where we're gonna talk a little bit about how you can prepare and plan for the shortage in your lab. And that's gonna be introduced uh, by Rosvan Tierdescu from Brooker. And he's going to give us a, pre a presentation uh, on uh, some preparations you can make for your facility. And then we'll have a discussion uh, with him, uh, John Webb from MR Resources and Nancy from the Pacific Northwest National Lab about uh, uh, basically about not panicking, making sure you understand your options and uh, what's uh, uh, and educate yourself on the uh, potential resources that are available to you and uh, how to, what to do in, a, in kind of a worst case scenario. So let's get started with um, part one. And uh, Phil, if you'll take over. Okay, thank you, Ken. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. So uh, I'm gonna spend about 30 minutes uh, going through you know, 10 or 12 slides uh, with some background on the helium shortage and a, and a bit of a look forward as to you know, what you can expect uh, later this year. and maybe for the next couple of years. So uh, let me launch into that so we don't waste too much time. Uh, so uh, this uh, 2022, uh, you know, was supposed to be a year of transition to plentiful helium supply. Uh, we have had, you know, those, for those of you who've been in this business for a long time, uh, which I'm sure many of you have, you know, have been reliant on uh, liquid helium for, Quite a few years. Uh, really, we've had 16 years of, of rough, uh, unreliable uh, conditions in the helium market, and this is we're currently in the fourth extended shortage uh, of helium. And and uh, you know we're not that creative, so we're calling it helium shortage 4.0. But the uh, you know we've had uh, 16 years where you know two years of short supply then a couple of years of good supply, then three years of short supply, that sort of a thing. Uh, this year, uh, we were expecting things to get much better. Uh, there is a, uh, a plant, uh, Gazprom is uh, building a huge uh, facility in Siberia. It's a huge natural gas processing plant called the Amor plant, the Amor project. And uh, that plant uh, you know, will produce helium as a byproduct. And it's a huge, potentially huge source uh, at full capacity. Uh, it, would, it would add about one third to the world's uh, helium supply. So that was gonna be a big event. Uh, it was supposed to start up late last year and it did briefly start up in September uh, and uh, ran for a few weeks. And then the plant uh, went down uh, as planned to complete some of the uh, punch list uh, construction items. 
But while it was down, they had a, uh, a fire on October 8th. Then they had a more serious uh, explosion and fire on January 5th. And basically that facility isn't gonna produce any, any helium in 2022. And it's unclear when it will restart. Hopefully it'll restart in 2023. The, uh, but in any case, uh, we weren't, that's why we are experiencing a shortage right now. That's the single biggest reason, but not far from the only reason. Uh, there are other factors. Uh, the US Bureau of Land Management, which we call the BLM, uh, we had that acronym first. Uh, the, the BLM uh, uh, operates a helium purifier in, in uh, Amarillo. That uh, plant uh, processes crude helium that comes out of the Federal Reserve and delivers it to uh, four liquid helium plants that are connected to the BLM's uh, crude helium pipeline. Well, the BLM has, uh, their plant has been down since mid-January, it's still down. And that's taken about well, more than 10% of the world's supply off the market. So that's the other really big factor. Uh, there's been planned maintenance at two of the plants in Qatar. Qatar, uh, some of you may know, is the world's second largest source of helium after the US. Uh, there has been a little bit of an impact from the war in Ukraine on Algerian production because there's been less feed gas flowing to the LNG plants that produce byproduct helium uh, as the, some of the natural gas has been diverted to go under uh, through an undersea pipeline to Europe. And uh, the gas that goes through that pipeline does not have the uh, helium extracted. And then a few weeks ago, uh, we had another fire at a helium plant in Haven, Kansas, that uh, uh, it'll be three weeks tomorrow that took another uh, 50 million feet a year or so of supply off the market. So bottom line is this is another year of shortages, supply allocations, which I'm sure most of you or all of you are experiencing and uh, elevated prices. So there is a bit of good news here. There is a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and that is that the shortage should be less severe during the second half of this year uh, as long as the BLM resumes operation. And the BLM could resume operation any time in the next two to four weeks. So the, you know, the process is underway to get their plant restarted. So things, I'm not saying the shortage is gonna end in the second half of the year. I like to be pretty careful and clear about how I say that, but I think that it can become less severe and allocation percentages could increase. Okay, so I, I've kind of talked through these already, but I, I think folks like to see the, uh, you know, a, a nice neat list of, you know, why, why we're having the shortage. So this is the nice neat list. The delayed startup of the Gazprom project, the outage of the BLM's plant, um, pl the uh, plan maintenance and cutter, which took, you know, pretty large uh, 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 increments of capacity out of the market in February and March. So, you know, you had a, a bunch of negative things going on at the same time, which is why the shortage got so bad. Uh, the reduction in Algerian production that uh, affects the uh, healing production from the Arzu Algeria plant. And then finally, the fire at Haven, Kansas. So that's the, you know, the one slide summary. Sometimes, you know, if, if there was a slide you were going to show your management or something, that's probably the one slide summary. Okay, so... Talking about Q1 and Q2, uh, and, uh, you know, so where we're at now, uh, in my opinion, we will look back on Q1 and Q2 as the peak of healing shortage 4.0. Uh, and uh, again, depending on who your supplier is, but four of the five helium majors are have been allocating supply, and those allocations have ranged from 45 to 65%. Uh, Air Products has not been allocating. They have uh, chosen to price gouge instead of allocating, <laughs> but they are in a better supply position than the others, uh, and they have been able to avoid allocations. Uh, most of the demand lost to, uh, due to COVID has come back. Um, the uh, BLM allocations have, you know, been going on since January, but the restart of the, the crude helium enrichment unit is what that acronym stands for. It's pretty eminent. Uh, the uh, BLM has out, they've actually outsourced the responsibility for operating that plant to Messer, 
as of a few weeks ago. Uh, Messer can't help but uh, be more competent at running that plant than the BLM. Uh, no offense to my friends at the BLM, but they have not distinguished themselves over the last year or so in, in how they've uh, you know, they're, they're operated that plant or more accurately not operated that plant. Uh, the plant maintenance and cutter uh, was a big thing, but it's over. Uh, the uh, impact in Algeria is going to continue while the war in Ukraine continues. Uh, port bottlenecks due to COVID are still a problem in moving helium around the world, uh, particularly for the shipments between the U.S. West Coast and Asia. I don't know if there's folks on this call from Asia. I imagine there might be. And then, you know, in, as far as pricing, uh, well, spot prices have absolutely gone parabolic in the last, uh, let's say, four or five months. They're at levels I've never seen before. Uh, contract prices have also been moving up, but they haven't gone uh, crazy, at least not yet. So that's kind of the snapshot of like right now. And right now, I think we're at the peak of the shortage. Uh, through the end of the year, I still think we're going to experience shortage, less severe. Uh, we're not going to see any production from Russia, I don't believe. Uh, I think the BLM outage is going to end in the next two to four weeks. Uh, Messer is in charge. As I said, they've got 16 people in Amarillo trying to get the BLM's plant sorted out, which is a lot of people. They didn't, they didn't have 16 people lying around doing nothing. So they've pulled people from all other different projects and things to work on this. Uh, another bit of good news is ExxonMobil had been planning uh, a maintenance shutdown in August. It would have been uh, pretty severe. It was going to be a 50% shutdown for three weeks, and Exxon operates the uh, largest plant in the world. Uh, so uh, uh, that would have negated the benefit of getting the BLM back online. That's uh, They have... Uh, uh, canceled their maintenance or at least pushed it till 2023, uh, you know, to be helpful, frankly. Uh, they uh, recently hired their first ever uh, employee from the industrial gas industry to work in their helium uh, uh, marketing team. And uh, that person has, I think, positively influenced them to not take a shutdown now or soon. Uh, there isn't going to be a lot of new supply entering the market this year, so it's not going to be enough to move the needle. Uh, the allocations are probably going to continue throughout the year, uh, but uh, allocation percentages should increase later in the year. Um, contract prices are going to be trending up, uh, and there is a risk to the upside. I mean, that's a question of just how, you know, how uh, how nice or greedy the gas suppliers are. I mean, the, the, they have pretty much freedom to raise prices right now because there's not much alternative. And uh, I think spot prices are going to stabilize and they may come down a bit. Uh, the, the, there is a bit of a wild card to this. And the wild card is that another positive factor is that demand for helium uh, may come down a little bit. And the reasons for that, well, we have a uh, the COVID lockdowns in Shanghai and in China, well, China's the world's second biggest market. So to the extent that they're shut down, they're going to consume less helium. Uh, there are some uh, second level factors going on in the market that aren't obvious. But, you know, if there's a chip shortage and you can't produce as many cars because of the chip shortage, well, the airbag cartridge, the airbag manufacturers don't need as much helium. So that's a place where you know, not many people think about, well, you know, airbag manufacturing is a, you know, significant uh, use of helium, but it is. And, and that's one area that demand is down. Uh, and uh, there could even be uh, reductions uh, because of the war in Ukraine, where uh, neon production is, is very uh, uh, significant in Ukraine. And to the extent that there's a shortage of neon, which is very important to semiconductor manufacturing. Well, if you can't run a, a wafer fab at capacity because you can't get all of the neon you need, well, that would also reduce helium demand. So there's some, some things going on on the demand side that may also help uh, reduce the shortage. And, and let's not forget the possibility of recession 
which uh, you know we hear about more and more kind of every every week, uh, and that also would reduce demand. So I, I wouldn't rule out the possibility of even a, a very tight balance uh, before the end of the year. Okay, so what's it look like for the next couple of years? Well, the uh, a lot of uncertainty, and the, the biggest source of the uncertainty is the questions about when that Amore project will finally get back up and running. I'm gonna show you a video of the explosion at the plant in, a, in, a, in another slide or two. But uh, if, you know, when that plant gets running and, and ramps up production, we're not gonna have any shortages probably for a long time because it's that big of a plant. And there are other projects in the pipeline to start helium production in the next few years. Uh, and uh, you know the other big question about 2023 is, are we going to have a, a recession? And if we do, how bad is it going to be? But as far as like, the timing of when a war starts up, uh, it's really up in the air right now. And you know I'm hoping that it would start up by the by mid year, uh, but uh, it is impacted by the war, and uh, there's a possibility. And you know there's some fe some people think that plant won't start up until 2024. So I think it's probably more likely than not that by the end of 2023, we'll have two of the three tranches of a more production producing. But um, I'm not gonna say anything here as a sure thing. The, the war is a real wild card. So I wanna talk a little bit about the impact of the Ukraine invasion, because uh, you know, that's a question that everybody you know, wants, to, wants to ask. So, so far, the sanctions have not impacted uh, the natural gas uh, and energy se sector that bad, but natural gas is what we care about when it comes to helium. And Gazprom, if, if, if today they would still be able to sell helium. So helium has not been directly impacted yet. Uh, the little bit of supply, there is a, a small Russian plant in Orenburg that produces mainly for the uh, Russian domestic market. That supply has been cut off uh, from Europe, but it wasn't very much. So that's kind of a minimal thing. I mentioned how Algerian supply has been partially curtailed. Um, but the bigger impact of the war uh, is that it's going to delay the restart and the ramp up of the Amor project, as well as a couple of other uh, smaller uh, Russian helium projects that are under construction. Uh, by a, a company called Irkutsk Oil Company. Uh, Irkutsk Oil Company, if I doubt that anybody on this call has ever heard of them, but they're the largest private oil producer uh, in Russia. They're, you know, a billion dollar type company. They're a big company. Uh, INK is how they refer to themselves. Um, and uh, they have a project that could start up by the end of the, by the, end of the year if things go according to plan. But I think there's a good possibility it'll, it'll be delayed till next year. So why the delays? Well, uh, the Russians rely on foreign expertise uh, to build their helium plants. The primary contractor at Amor is Lindy. The primary contractor for uh, Irkutsk Oil Company is a company that was called uh, uh, Cryogenic Technologies, but they've been acquired by Chart. So Chart is the uh, also a, a US-based company. Uh, so those companies are not having their people uh, uh, travel to Russia while all this is going on. So the foreign experts can't can't be hands on. You know they're still trying to help remotely, but it's not the same as being there. And then uh, to the extent that uh, Gazprom needs to procure parts and equipment to replace the the, uh, the equipment that was damaged by that explosion, uh, well, they're not going to be able to procure parts and equipment from European or uh, or American uh, suppliers. So that means they're going to have to develop uh, alternative sources. Uh, they could be domestic, they could be Chinese, they could be whatever, but that is not necessarily a simple thing. So that's the biggest impact of the war in Ukraine on helium. Uh, if we look further out, it gets kind of uh, fuzzy, but it gets kind of interesting. So Gazprom has five contracts signed with the major helium uh, distribution companies around the world. And at least four of those five are based in countries that, that would be participating in sanctions. So there, there is a possibility that some or all of those contracts could unravel uh, due to sanctions 
depending on how long this war drags out, depending on how, you know, what happens to the sanctions. And if that happens, uh, there's still plenty of market for gas prompts, helium in countries that aren't participating in the sanctions, China, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore. So there's a market for the helium. But again, there's a second level of uh, impact here that isn't obvious. Uh, to get that helium to market, wh wherever it's going, is going to require several hundred of these 11,000 gallon cryogenic containers that, uh, uh, that you need to transport liquid helium. And they're expensive. They cost about a million dollars a piece. But the, the, the bigger factor is that they have a very long lead time right now. There's only two manufacturers. They're quoting lead times of around two years. So if Gazprom said, well, I'm ready to produce helium, uh, but I, my contract customers can't take it, so I need new customers. Well, those new customers might want to take it, but it might take them up to two years to, to uh, buy the containers that they needed to, to uh, take it to market. So, you know, you could have a long delay. If, if everything happens wrong, you could end up not having helium or a lot of helium from a more in the market, you know, even the 2025 or even longer. So I don't think that's going to happen. I don't want to scare anybody, but, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about that. So uh, summing that up, uh, is a short-term impact of the war? Not much, not much on helium, much on a lot of other things. Uh, but the duration of helium shortage 4.0, or at least the very tight markets until we get the relief from a more is likely to be extended uh, due to the war. Um, so just very, very brief, briefly, I don't want to, I don't think the folks on this call are that interested in this, but the more project is going to be the single most important factor affecting helium markets for the next, let's say, five years. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the source of the helium is a very, very large natural gas processing plant that's uh, being built in, a, in Siberia near a town called Slobodny. Uh, you can't pronounce that unless you have uh, Eastern European ancestry, which I do. Uh, but uh, in any case, the plant is going to have three uh, separate helium trains that will each produce 700 million feet a year of helium. So that's 2.1 BCF total. Total world supply is about 6.5 BCF uh, right now. So it's a one third addition to uh, supply. And you can see they have offtake agreements with all of the big uh, industrial gas companies. Uh, it's very low cost product as well because the pricing was established uh, way, you know, actually before helium shortage 3.0 and they had a, a pretty uh, poorly thought out price indexation formula in their contracts. So the price is far below current market uh, price for helium. So um, anyway, uh, that, that's pretty much, uh, you know, the other points on that slide I've already gone through. So just to uh, break up the uh, death by PowerPoint uh, word slides, I have one slide that is kind of interesting coming up. And this was uh, a video of the explosion that must be from the, uh, the CAM uh, in the control room at the Amor Gas Processing Center. It's a short video. Okay, so uh, you could see uh, why that plant isn't going to run for a while from that video. Uh, this I only have two more slides, I think. Uh, the um, this slide is uh, trying to depict capacity utilization uh, in the uh, healing business. The right. The right side is capacity utilization, the right side of the graph. And this, this blue uh, line that kind of goes up and down and around, that's meant to represent capacity utilization. The point of this slide is that, you know, we're way up high around 100% capacity utilization if everything is running, which it's not. And that's why we're in a shortage. Uh, but when the Amore product comes into the market, our capacity utilization uh, is going to drop into the low to mid 80s. And it's going to stay there for quite a while. So uh, I know it's probably hard to believe after we've con been conditioned over the last 16 years to expect shortages every other year or every couple of years. 
But we really could see a sustained period of more plentiful uh, helium supply once a more gets into the market. The, the real question about this chart is when do we get the drop? We get the drop when the more comes into the market, and I'm not sure when that's going to be. You know, but next year, year after, should happen. So summing all this up, uh, I think you know you guys all know we're in the midst of healing shortage uh, 4.0 for all the reasons we talked about. Uh, I'm hopeful that 2023 uh, we'll see some uh, significant improvement uh, if and when a more uh, starts to produce. Uh, I am assuming that two of Amore's three helium plants will be approaching full capacity by the end of 2023, and the capacity utilization will be a lot lower and a lot more favorable uh, by the end of uh, next year. Uh, this slide about demand, this comment about demand growth is a little misleading. Uh, it, it, would, it really means to imply that the underlying demand growth, if there wasn't a shortage, and uh, if we weren't experiencing some of the short-term things we're experiencing, like the lockdowns from COVID, would probably be in that three or four percent range. And the big driver is going to be construction of new wafer fabs, which, you know, I think most of us are aware that there's, uh, you know, onshoring uh, uh, going on uh, and a, a drive to build a lot of new uh, wafer fabs over the next few years, and that will be a driver of uh, helium demand growth. Uh, Prices are going to increase this year. They have increased. They'll continue to increase to ration supply, and uh, they're going to remain elevated until the market becomes confident uh, in a more production or that the, you know that the shortage is over. And uh, you know, and prices will increase because the gas suppliers have the ability to raise them. I mean, that's just the you know when there's a shortage, the suppliers have all the power, and uh, it's definitely a seller's market right now. And again, pricing will should moderate once some more production starts up and the uh, production starts to ramp. So that's my uh, my uh, presentation. Uh, you know, there's my contact information. If anybody has any more uh, an interest in you know more detailed questions or information or assistance of some kind, and uh, I will uh, turn it back over to Ken, and I'll end my share. All right, thank you, Phil. That was tremendous. And it looks like there's maybe some good news in there. And uh, we all cross our fingers that in uh, July or June, we'll, we'll get a little easing of this crisis. Um, there were a couple of questions that kind of came up while you were talking. One was about uh, North American helium or North America helium. Uh -huh. uh, I'm not familiar with them, but there was a question about uh, uh, what production they have. Yeah, uh, North American Helium has uh, two plants now. They're small plants. I mean, 60 million feet a year is, uh, you know, 1% uh, of global capacity. So it's a, it's a small increment. They are, they do have plans uh, underway to, to uh, introduce uh, some more production. Uh, and uh, it's great for them because they're bringing a new supply into a very, you know, a market where they can uh, secure very favorable pricing. But uh, one percent is one percent. You know, if we're having a shortage that's, you know, twenty percent, uh, you know, every one every percent helps, but uh, uh, you know, it, it's not going to fix the shortage by themselves. It will make a lot of money for North American helium, however. Okay, great. Well, we have some other questions in the chat, but I'll hold on those until we hear from our uh, other two panel members. So let's move to. Craig uh, from uh, CNE News, if you can tell us what your sources have been able to tell you about this crisis. Sure, so I've been talking to a handful of different folks, including North American Helium, actually. Um, and yeah, I mean, a lot of what Phil said is, of course, I, I agree with it completely. Uh, one of the things, the senses I'm getting from, you know, the helium suppliers, from some of the gas majors, and from some of the recycling companies, is that the, the prices might not come back down at all, or they might not come back down very much for a long time. Um, the only person that even told me that, you know, maybe the prices will come down was somebody from uh, one of the industrial, one of the gas majors. Uh, they asked to remain anonymous, so I can't tell you who it was or which supplier. Um, but even they said that they were looking at a probably a long-term price floor of about $100 per thousand, or yeah, thousand cubic feet 
Um, and Philippi would be better at converting that to leaders than I would be. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what you can kind of expect. So I ended up talking to um, Quantum Design, which is one of the people that make helium recycling units. Um, and I also read a little bit about Bob Brooker. It's recently come out with some helium recycling, some refreshed helium recycling offerings as well. Um, and with the kind of numbers that we're seeing, it looks like it takes about five years or so to pay that off on most sizes of systems. Um, so that starts to get you know, pretty attractive, I think, for a lot of folks. And the, the big problem with that is that there aren't a whole lot of, uh, there's not a lot of equipment available. Uh, Quantum Design is on a six to 10 month lead time. So you put in an order and they can get everything together uh, and to you by six to 10 months. Um, and that's you know the same supply chain rest restrictions that everybody is having. You know, they still have to buy the parts and the pumps. Um, so that is definitely something that I think a lot of people should be doing if they can. I know that if you're on a NIST funding, um, there are some money available through NIST to do helium recycling. I don't know about NIH. Um, so that's something they would definitely be looking into. Uh, talking with them, uh, they, you can get a system that makes sense and, and pays for itself, getting down to about two, you know, 400-ish NMRs. If you have two of those in a room, you can get a system that makes sense uh, for that size and starts to pay itself off. Now, you do have to have room for it. Um, you know, some of them will require a big bag that fills with helium. Um, I've heard a couple of people talk recently in some recent meetings about a, kind of a hub and spoke system where a bunch of different people might be capturing and compressing the helium, but there's one liquefier that, you know, a campus or even a metropolitan area might be able to share. Um, and that, for at least from quantum design, they think that that could work really, really well. Um, and so, I mean, like I know here in Baltimore, Hopkins, the physics department has a liquefier. Um, and, you know, I don't know if they're willing to share or not. <laughs> um, but that's, I think, something that could really be quicker to deploy than maybe buying your own recycling unit right away. I know you people got to talk to, to deans and, and funders. Um, you're looking at a minimum of about $100,000 to put in a recycling system, at least from Quantum Design. I don't know if Brooker's system is priced differently. Um, and there are a couple other suppliers like Cryomech and Quantum Technologies. So, if, you know, I'm not in the lab myself anymore these days, but if I was still doing NMR regularly, the business that I would be trying to, to talk to my funders about. Um, one thing that I think is interesting is that talking to some of the, you know, Messer's competitors, they are excited about Messer taking over the BLM facility. Um, one of the problems that they've been having there is that because it's been, the plan has been to shut it down or privatize it for so long, they haven't been able to recruit and retain the long-term federal staffing that a facility like that normally needs because they, you know, the federal staffers want to stay on their pensions. And there's other reasons when you already are a federal employee that you want to stay there. Um, and so nobody wants to be the ones there at the BLM turning the lights off. So with Messer taking it over, a lot of that recruiting problem is going to be, is going to go away. Um, so I also have high hopes for what, you know, the privatization. I'm not, I'm not necessarily a big privatization fan, you know, economically, but I think in this case, it's gonna, it is going to be a good thing um, for the facilities. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to... I think this is the major thing that I came out of some of the conversations I've had with. Um, there is a lot of, I think that the North American helium, both the company itself and the other North American helium suppliers are really interesting because the big difference there is they are not connected to natural gas production. And their, their supply, their quantity is not yet at the kind of scales where they're gonna be totally alleviating any crises. Um, but long-term having that stability you know, on the same continent for a lot of folks here in this call, and having it unconnected to the volatile natural gas markets, I think is really attractive. Um, so I'm, I have high hopes for those companies, um, but they are right now kind of a drop in the bucket. So that's kind of the things that I came up with in my digging around. Um, and yeah, it's a rough time. I really feel sorry for you. One thing I wanted to, to mention is I have heard some rumors and some reports of uh, gas majors forcing people to sign uh, no recycle clauses in order to get onto a contract. Um, and I know that if you're in that situation, you probably, you know, are also signing an NDA. Um, but if anybody is able to talk to me about that, I'd really like to write a story for CNN on that. That seems like the sort of thing that, uh, that a reporter like me should be writing about. Um, so my contact information is available. And if you can talk to me off the record or on the record, um, I would love to hear about those cases because that needs to be, that's, that's not cool, <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah, and we, but Craig, you know, if I can jump in, that, that is outrageous. I hadn't heard that before you mentioned it. I, and uh, 
uh, anybody who would sign one of those things is nuts. Uh, it sounds like blackmail. And I, I wonder if it wasn't some overzealous local sales guy or local product manager, because that is really like a, a pretty outrageous tactic if anybody's doing that. All right, uh, Craig, did you have anything else? Um, I think it's all the things I had ahead of time. I, I'm happy to help answer some questions as well, um, but that's it for me, I think. All right, well, we have one more panel member uh, for this portion before we get to some questions from the audience. Uh, and that's uh, Nash, Nancy Washington from uh, PNNL. Um, hey, everybody, I'm glad that you could join us. So I'm here to describe the process that we had to go through at Pacific Northwest National Lab as a result of having our monthly helium allocation cut. And so at PNNL, we have uh, 29 systems. Most are NMRs, 24 NMRs, and uh, five FTICRs that require liquid helium. And so we're, we have substantial need, clearly. And we have, you know, our NMRs run from 300 megahertz to 850 megahertz. We've got pump magnets. And so this is serious. We typically would have an allocation of about 2,400 liters a month. The majority of that, probably 98% of it, went to the NMRs and the FPICRs, you know, with the other 2% going for experimentalists across the lab that wanted to do low temperature experiments. And so um, in February, our allocation was decreased to about 1,600 liters a month. And what we did, and we all came together as a magnetic resonance community across the lab and said, ah, you know, we, we, we've got to make decisions. We have to address this. So at 1600 liters a month, we decided, okay, we will fill all of the NMRs because it was enough for that. And we were lucky in that the FTICRs had recently been filled and they don't require filling nearly as often as, as most of the NMR magnets. And so we thought, okay, you know, this will last you know, a couple of months, we'll, we'll scrape by and we'll cut off all of the experimentalists that just need it to do the low temperature experiments. They weren't thrilled about it, but they understood. You know, you keep your instruments alive. And then in April, our allocation was cut to 940. Uh, and that was not enough to keep our, all of our systems up. And so we had to go through a process of determining what criteria we were going to use uh, and we graded each system, the FTICRs and the NMRs as a function of this criteria. You know, what was the demand for the system, which projects benefited from it, you know, basically which ones do we really need to keep our projects rolling and which ones could we kind of sacrifice? And also the criteria was the technical ability to actually de-energize the magnets either ourselves or to have a vendor come out and do that. And so we're really lucky at PNNL in that we have a magnet engineer that used to work for Varian. And he is highly skilled. And for many of our systems, we also have the hardware, and this is gonna be discussed a little later by Rosvon, we have the hardware to be able to do this and the expertise to do it on probably three quarters of our systems. And so, um, we went through and, and we prioritized systems and I'll be honest, it, it was painful, right? Because there's a lot of stakeholders. There's a lot of researchers that rely on these things. And we made a determination of which systems we were going to de-energize. And so we went through and de-energized a 750 uh, narrow bore. It's a variant, but it also did solids. So this was wide use broadband. Uh, we de-energized a 300 wide bore for solids. We de-energized a 600 narrow bore that was primarily used for protein and small molecule work. Uh, and uh, I had to make the painful decision to uh, bring down an 800 megahertz DNP that uh, was a Bruker instrument and it's the first commercial of its kind. And uh, it, the instrument was slated to move to a new building. So we were going to have to bring it down anyways, right? And so I worked with Bruker and, and they're here now and they're de-energizing my DNP. And this is particularly painful because that's my baby. 
uh, we just didn't have the helium. It took 140 liters of helium a month on average to keep it up and we simply couldn't do it, right? And so that's what we've had to do. And right now we're looking at the situation and saying, okay, we can limp along with 940 liters with our remaining systems until our 21 Tesla FTICR needs to get filled. And it typically gets filled only about once a year and it's 2000 liters. And, um, and we're just, we're at a loss. I mean, this has been really uh, traumatizing, I think, for a lot of our people because they've never experienced anything like this. And so right now we're in the process. Uh, we've gotten quotes for the helium recovery and liquefaction systems. And we've gotten quotes for facility mods, but we're a national lab. There's a lot of bureaucracy. And so I'm, I'm waiting on uh, basically the okay to tell us, you know, where, what type of money we can use to buy these things. And, and I'll be perfectly honest. Um, we don't care if the supply is, is saturated across the globe in a year or two. I never, none of us ever want to be at risk like this again, right? This has been terrible. And there we've minimized the impact to our programs and, and our projects, but we're really scrambling to keep that that impact to a minimum, right? And it's funny, you can say, oh, well, you know, just come in at midnight, that's great. I live five minutes from the lab, so I can do that, but, but that is unsustainable, right? And so, um, and I also realize how fortunate we are to have the magnet engineers. So, so that's been our experience. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to ask any questions about where, what criteria we used or, or how we've gone about this. All right, thank you. I think you were definitely the bellwether for this discussion when your post uh, showed up on uh, Amrol. Uh, I had I had seen some sort of rumblings about it on uh, other social media platforms, but when I heard your story, I was I was quite shocked that a that a lab in your position with uh, government resources was going to have to be shutting down magnets and what that what that could mean for smaller labs where they only have one system. All right, well, we have a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, uh, some of these are re related to uh, recovery systems and things like that. I think we're gonna save those questions for the second half of the talk, but we do have some questions. Uh, if some of the other panel members have uh, had an opportunity to peek through here. Um, one question was about uh, the BLM uh, and Messer, whether they're planning on to replenish the strategic helium reserve after this crisis. Uh, Phil, you mentioned this in the chat, but if you could go ahead and comment again about that. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, the answer to that is no. I mean, the, uh, uh, the the strategic reserve is going in the other direction. So it's been, a lot of it's been sold off and consumed and depleted. And the BLM is uh, actually the, the GSA is uh, in the process of preparing to auction off the remainder of the Federal Reserve uh, and uh, the BLM's healing equipment uh, toward the end of this year, third quarter or fourth quarter of this year. And uh, the BLM will continue to operate, but it'll have a private owner uh, as of, you know, probably the end of the year or early next year. And uh, it will continue to decline in terms of deliverable capacity and it will you know gradually become less important to uh to healy world as time goes on well that seems uh dangerously short-sighted to me but i i don't know I'm not a policy expert well i mean just to add to that you know when there's a shortage in the world well how would you replenish the uh strategic reserve anyway i mean you need to have a surplus before you can think about replenishing the strategic stockpile. Same as oil. I mean, you know, the we've been uh, removing oil from the uh, federal, you know, from the national stockpile. And, uh, you know, at some point we'll probably try to replenish it, but not until there's a surplus. Mm -hmm. All right. Ken, uh, Ken, if I could, yeah. if I could, uh, Nancy hits the problem very squarely on the head. Uh, this is the here and now. Uh, I believe that uh, probably nearly everyone on this call today does have a major concern of how do we keep these magnets going? Uh, well, maybe some more than others. 
those that uh, have uh, reclamation and uh, re uh, reliquifaction systems, uh, that's great. Uh, uh, certainly in a uh, little bit less uh, uh, hot water than uh, others at this point. Uh, so my question to uh, Phil, uh, and uh, not so incidentally, if there is a uh, uh, intergalactic helium guru, uh, it is Phil Kornbluth. Uh, I've known Phil for uh, uh, 35 years, uh, give or take. And uh, Phil, my question to you is that although reclamation systems, uh, reliquifaction systems, uh, and so forth, all well and good. If you've got one now, that's great. Uh, maybe not so feasible, uh, uh, you know, for the here and now. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, delivery times on this equipment is uh, it's it's not tomorrow. It's not next week. Uh, and that is if uh, the users have the money uh, uh, to get these to begin with. But my question to you, Phil, is looking at the here and now. How do we keep these magnets going? There, there is liquid helium available. Uh, can you suggest uh, any creative ways perhaps that people might consider uh, in, in, in locating and purchasing product? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it, clearly, you know, it, it, it takes uh, uh, room in your budget to, to buy helium on the spot market. Uh, and, um, uh, a little bit of uh, creativity, perhaps, but you know, if you know, every situation is unique. But if let's say I needed a small amount of liquid helium and I couldn't find anybody to sell me liquid helium, uh, well, you know, one thing you could do is try to procure gaseous helium, you know, cylinder quantities of helium from you know a, a gas and welding distributor, and then if you could identify a uh, a liquefier, either a helium liquefier at a university lab or or a government lab or something like that, where if you brought the gaseous helium, they might be able to you know fill it into a doer for you. So I mean, there there are ways around the shortage. That's a small scale way. And and just to expand on that a little bit, you know, the, the allocations are put in place by the the, the majors, so, and when they're allocating supply, they are not allowed to quote. Uh, new business at any price because they're they've declared force majeure with their contract customers and if their contract customers find out that they're selling to new customers at a higher price they're going to sue them and you know they'd be very exposed to uh, a class action lawsuit or something like that so that, the, the majors aren't going to do that now these there are hundreds of gas and welding distributors around the country who supply uh, smaller quantities of helium and they're not formally, they, they mean they're getting allocated by the majors, but they're not going to the trouble uh, and formality of allocating to their customers. So they are in the position of, you know, they're a small business band for the most part, some of them not so small, but if you approach them and say, hey, look, I really need helium, I'll pay a high price. There's a good chance they might take helium away from a, a lower priced customer or someone who's using helium to fill party balloons and sell it to you, albeit it might be three times the normal price, but you might, but you probably could get it. So that the advice I've been giving when small, uh, you know, folks who need a small quantity of gas is helium approach me is I, I pull out my gas and welding distributors directory. There is one, and I look, I you know, I, I look up, you know, who the suppliers are in their geography, and I, I give them the contact information, and I say, hey, you know, work the phones and uh, see what you can find. Now, again, if you can, if you bring your own molecules, if you, if you buy the gas, you should be able to find somebody to uh, liquefy it for you, even if it's one of the majors, uh, because the majors have the doers. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I would say with this group, you know, find a small liquefier in a lab somewhere in reasonable proximity to where you are and, and uh, Buy the gas on the spot market and see if you can, you know, put a solution together. That's the smaller uh, solution for someone who really wants to not have to turn turn uh, turn down a uh, a machine. So let me interject here. This was one thing I didn't bring up <clears throat> during my talk, and there was a question in the chat. So 
Um, we have been unable to identify a supplier that will sell us liquid helium mm -hmm. and, and at any price, basically, with the exception of Bruker, who will, uh, they will sell us a fill service, but mm -hmm. only for their systems. Right. And so of all of our 29 systems, we've got five Bruker systems. Right. Well, it's, it, it, you know, it's, so it's, we're stuck. It's much harder to find liquid helium than gaseous helium. So the, the nuance of what I said versus what your, yep. your comment, you'd need to buy it as gas because that's what the gas and volume distributors are, are handling. And then you'd need to find some place to liquefy it for you. And there, you know, there are a fair number of liquefiers at different labs and universities and things like that. So it's not trivial, it's not easy, it, but it's not impossible either. So it's a question of money and how much time you're willing to devote to solve the problem. And, and then also, Phil, uh, a very useful information, uh, but also before the meeting started, uh, you had indicated that in, uh, I, I'm assuming, uh, fairly recent times that you've been successful in uh, uh, putting together some uh, very large quantity uh, 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 amounts of uh, liquid helium uh, uh, to the extent of, uh, uh, I believe you mentioned, uh, 11,000 gallon uh, trailer truck loads. Mm -hmm. uh, is, it, what, is, is it feasible or possible that uh, uh, maybe... Uh, you know, maybe even some of the larger labs, uh, maybe uh, a spearhead, some sort of a consortium or a group that might purchase a uh, trailer load. And I think you also mentioned that, uh, you know, this might be done in conjunction uh, with one of the uh, helium suppliers that they in, they in turn uh, would maybe fill uh, individual doers and uh, send them out to delivery, uh, you know, for people involved in, in, in such a uh, consortium. Uh, it is, John. And, you know, the thing is, uh, bulk liquid helium uh, spot loads do, you know, sell here and there. And, and I, I, I mentioned uh, earlier that I had brokered uh, actually nine of them so far this year. Uh, an 11,000 gallon container uh, filled with liquid helium right now would cost about a million bucks. So, you know, for starters, this consortium would need to have a pretty uh, good helium budget. But, you know, Absolutely, uh, at a price, uh, a thousand gallon container, uh, uh, excuse me, an 11,000 gallon container could be purchased. And you could combine that with some kind of a tolling arrangement with one of the helium majors who would take the helium and fill it into doers for you and, and probably do the delivery. Uh, it's doable. Again, it's not easily doable. And I, I would venture to say it's never been done before. But as far as the the steps that need to take place to make it happen, they're all, uh, the individual steps are all pretty easy. And I can, I can tell you that in the party balloon sector, I'm sure everybody's heard of Party City. Uh, you know, Party City has actually done this type of thing where they've bought 11,000 gallon container loads on the spot market and done a deal with one of the majors to deliver it back to them all around the country to their stores. So uh, it would, it's kind of a similar type of thing. It's just that, that you know, the folks on this call want liquid helium instead of gaseous helium. But it's, it's doable. It's, it's more than theoretically doable, but you'd need to have a pretty big group of folks who could, who could uh, you know, get together to buy a million dollars worth of helium. Good, good information, Phil. And uh, uh, like you say, it may not be uh, uh, too far-fetched to do so. Uh, and uh, I'll say that uh, 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 any interested folks uh, 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 could possibly reach out to you to uh, uh, perhaps uh, facilitate this sort of thing. Yeah, it's definitely not a solution for an individual lab. You know, it would take, uh, uh, you know, frankly, I would see it as something that maybe, you know, your group who's got this big, uh, you know, network of folks with NMR machines, uh, might be able to say, you know, everybody who's interested in this, you know, let me know. And then, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's theoretically doable. Th thank you, Phil. You're welcome. So is that a, a few questions come up in the chat about the logistics of a hub and spoke system? Um, and I think that uh, Bob kind of hit it on the head that there are more people that are licensed to move this sort of thing than, than have it to supply. 
So your, your gas majors might be happy to have like a tolling arrangement, like Phil was talking about for moving these things between different locations in inner Chicago or a Boston or a Baltimore. Um, but also your welding and gas suppliers, and there are a lot of those in every city, um, in most cases have the permits that they need to, to move liquid and uh, cylinder helium. Uh, so those would be the kind of the two resources, because you're right, it's not safe or legal to move it across the street yourself. I know that in some universities, they even have tunnel systems, so they can get around that as a loophole going between two chemistry buildings. Um, and that is a, yeah. So those are the things that I'll be looking for is those welding and gas suppliers and even just calling up the gas majors again. They're, they're big companies. If it's the same people asking for our recycling, uh, no recycling clauses, they might not like that idea, but the other ones probably would. All right, thanks everybody. I think we're uh, we're almost at an hour and ten minutes, and we're just we're just on part one. So I think we're going to need to move to part two, which is uh, no less uh, large of a topic. Uh, we will hopefully have time at the end to cover any questions that have come through the chat. But for now, let's move to part two, and uh, we're going to have uh, Razvan Tirdescu. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, but He's from Bricker and he's going to uh, introduce this topic for us. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Ken, and uh, thanks everyone for attending and for the Ivan committee to um, to invite us. Um, all right, so <clears throat> uh, so our presentation would be a very good complement, I would say, to what we heard before from uh, Phil and. Craig and John and Nancy. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about what, how we see things in terms of trying to helping the community with um, um, the logistics and the technicality of uh, connecting helium recovery systems, what we can do from our end. Uh, talking about the newer uh, version that Craig mentioned earlier that we just introduced um, at the ENC a few weeks ago for just helium recovery only, like a miniature type of recovery. Um, and also, at the end, we have a slide on, you know, what to do in case there is no other option and how to safely de-energize the magnet and why do we really need to um, follow certain um, guidelines so we do not cause a safety hazard for personnel or for the instrument. So, um, <clears throat> I would say uh, first, so <clears throat> this would be a continuation of uh, the Ivan meeting that was organized uh, back in September 2020. And at the time, um, there were several of the customers who already had recovery system installed, <clears throat> listed here, uh, presented um, their experiences with the systems. Uh, the systems included, um, you know, system from quantum design, quantum technology, and, uh, and cryomac. <clears throat> so. We have been, especially in the last uh, few months, we've been um, receiving a lot of, on a weekly basis, a lot of emails from customers who already purchased such a system, are waiting for it, or who are planning to, um, to uh, invest in such a system. So uh, asking us how to connect those systems, um, what is the safe way to prevent problems later on and so forth. So we put together a document actually that we started sharing with customers that are asking. The document was put together by uh, our colleagues in, in Switzerland uh, with both the R&D group and the service group. Um, and here are some of the slides that are actually experts from that document explain this in a more visual way. So every uh, recovery system should not be viewed as a separate thing, but also um, as part of the whole uh, set up with the NMR magnets. So all the pipes, valves, and other components have to be uh, accounted for in terms of sizes um, and type of components. In the end, the goals are to, of course, have a safe, reliable operation of NMR magnets without uh, any detrimental artifacts. And of course, to have a reliable and efficient recovery. So the document that we have actually is split um, in kind of two parts, one that is focusing on standard four Kelvin magnets, uh, which is more, it's a simpler uh, setup, and one that is focused on the subcool man magnets operating at two Kelvin. Here are some examples of some components, a standard exhaust valve at the back of a Brooker magnet. This is a hose for um, the helium recovery during a refill. 
This is a picture of, uh, <clears throat> of a pump into the BMPC system for subcool systems with the output of the pumps where actually the helium is actually exhausted and will have to be recovered, collected from. An example here of an artifact uh, in case that the pressure in the system is not stable. Um, <clears throat> next slide. Would, uh, would show you a diagram, as the simplest diagram of a recovery only system during a normal boil off. So this doesn't show any recovery during the transfer fill. So <clears throat> this is something that always have to be done with, for all these charts that will follow. The exhaust valve at the back of the magnet is probably the most critical important piece because it's gonna prevent uh, any flow back into the magnet. So this is a one way exhaust valve that Everyone of you that with the NMR lab should have this on your magnet. Then there's going to be a small plastic hose that um, will be connected uh, at the output of that exhaust valve that will be routed to the recovery system, to a storage bag, to a helium balloon through um, an overpressure valve. This is very important to have to prevent a problem in case there is some failures on the recovery system downstream. <clears throat> now, in case that the recovery also needs to capture the transfer fills, if you wanna do that as well, to have a full 100% recovery, then another hose has to be connected permanently to the magnet. So this will be a larger hose, as you see here in the diagram on the lower part. <clears throat> Again, the exhaust valve has to be there. And then there will be a three-way valve that will determine back, either the normal recovery during the normal boil-off or during the transfer. Very important that again, the 70 millibar overpressure valve should all be, be, always be present to prevent again problems to the magnet in case something downstream on the recovery sites fails. <clears throat> Important to observe that in buildings with vibrations, when you have the uh, helium recovery during refills, it's a, it's a metal um, recovery hose. And that one is also permanently connected to the magnet. So in case of building vibrations, it's important to consider the possibility of anchoring that hose to prevent vibrations being transmitted back to the magnet. Uh, many of you, have on your magnets APDs or type the magnet constant, independent of what's happening um, outside. <clears throat> In that case, um, the flow meter that you, you have on your system should always be after the APD. Otherwise, if you put the flow meter before, then you uh, possibly will encounter uh, oscillations into helium oscillations into the magnet. Um, very important to have the flow meter on all systems because in case of um, uh, a blockage, for instance, which can be very dangerous, immediately you can notice that the flow is reduced to zero. So either there is a blockage or there is a leak somewhere where uh, helium doesn't reach the flow meter. But typically if there is a leak, uh, you still see some flow, but if you see no flow, that, that's a, a sign, sign, a red flag that uh, really one needs to look into the system for, for blockages. Important to know that uh, the APD should be switched off a few hours before a helium transfer to allow the pressure inside the magnet to approach the atmospheric pressure in order to minimize flash evaporation of helium and risk, risk to the magnet. <clears throat> and this is the uh, last slide regarding um, the, the measures and the diagrams for uh, connecting a recovery system to magnets. And this is focused on subcool two Kelvin magnets. In this case, the nominal boil-off, as um, um, most of you that, of course, have the two Kelvin systems, now the, the boil-off, it's coming out, out of the um, outport uh, of the pump system. Or if you, have, if you are in APD mode, then also additional um, boil-off comes through the APD device as well. But most of the time it's here uh, in the heater mode, of course, out of the pumps. Uh, helium losses during refills, though, <clears throat> are exhausted at the top of the magnet, so out this exhaust valve again. And in order to capture those refills, it requires a dedicated helium refill recovery hose with a two-way valve here to separate it from
from the recovery system during normal operation. So you see the two-way valve here um, at the end of this recovery hose during transfer fills. If we go down at the bottom here, we can see that we have, uh, and again, just to emphasize, we still have the 70 millibar uh, over pressure valve here after the regular exhaust valve from the magnet at the top for the same reasons that we mentioned before. In case something goes wrong on the recovery side, one needs to have this overpressure valve here installed. But for, during the normal boil off, you see here this, the, the schematic is more complex. It, it does have an absorber because the output being from the pump, uh, one needs to really purify um, as much as possible with an absorber that helium before it goes into the, into the storage bag. And you can see also another 17 millibar um, a valve here, overpressure, uh, overpressure valve, as well as a five millibar here of the absorber to protect the magnet in case of the high pressure in the recovery system that could, of course, induce a back pressure to the, to the, towards the magnet. So <clears throat> with, with this diagram said, now the, we wanted to continue to have this discussion and um, show you how we see things in terms of selecting a solution, an optimum solution for recovery for your lab. And it, of course, it depends of your configuration in your lab, how many magnets you have, what type of magnets you have, in the end, what is actually overall uh, daily consumption, yearly consumption of helium. And um, <clears throat> uh, as you probably attended, if you attended the, the discussions back in uh, September 2020, uh, this system was uh, presented at the time um, by one of the speakers um, from Quantum Design, Quantum Technology, and uh, Cryomac also offers uh, such setups. Uh, this is a full high pressure with the helium bag with um, the uh, automatic purifier here, of course, the compressor, um, and the actual liquefier with the cold head. Another system here is for recovery and liquefaction, but only recovering the nominal boil off 80 to 85 percent from quantum design. They call it direct recovery. And uh, talking to Ken in the last couple of weeks, uh, he mentioned that actually they had one of these systems installed at their lab at, at Virginia Tech. And the other recovery also focused on 80 to 85, but only for recovery, not for liquefaction, is something that we just introduced to help the community with such solutions to recover the nominal boil off, which is 80 to 85%. So it's, the, it's not the full 100% solution, but it's, it's the majority of the helium consumption. And we put this slide up here to show you uh, what we have assessed in terms of the investment horizon, the ROI um, over years for the various solutions. So with the color, colors used here, the evaporate means you, know, you allow the helium to escape into the atmosphere and it's lost. As we all know, you know this is not you know, the best solution because helium is a is not a renewable source. Um, and um, you know, this, is, this is sad to see all this helium lost, even from a lab that has one or two magnets, right? Then if you start, if you start having you know, more than one magnet, like in this case here, when you have uh, just one and a half liters a day, you can see here that after six years, you can have one of those miniature systems and, uh, and have um, um, a good ROI for it. So in terms of price, those miniature systems to recover only not to liquefy are about a quarter of the price of the full-blown recovery and liquefaction system. So that's why you know, um, when you have low consumption, um, this, is, this will be a very good solution. And of course, the, the more the, uh, the, the consumption becomes, right? Uh, the sooner you can recover the cost from a small recovery, or then you switch to a lab scale. So the, green, the, 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 the orange is the recovery only miniature system. The green becomes the full lab scale. Um, the, the type of um, systems that you have learned of and you know of uh, from the vendors that I mentioned earlier, uh, which again are um, you know, um, still very much recommended um, as soon as you reach somewhere around five to six liters a day 
also they would consult uh, the same way from what our what our knowledge is as soon as you reach the threshold it is a good idea uh, it makes sense to invest in things however what we wanted to mention is that this is just an investment roi for cost but now we are also facing these shortages that you know no matter what cost i don't we don't have helium right so because of this <clears throat> we wanted to bring to the fact that actually even for one magnet right um or or two magnets when you have let's say even a, a liter a day having a, a recovery system although maybe is not um, a, a wonderful roi because there you know it, it takes years for instance more years to recover the cost however it will provide you that buffer that cushion and it's good for um, our resources, given the helium is not a renewable resource. And it's, once it's in the atmosphere, it's lost. So we, we believe in the idea of not letting this go into the air anymore and trying to find ways to recover as much as we can. Um, <clears throat> now, Brooker, besides these recovery systems over the years during our evolution of NMR magnets that introduced over decades, we have tried to make magnets more compact. And this was possible due to, of course, novel magnet designs, but due to the performance of superconducting wires that allowed us to make compact the magnets more compact, more shielded, and so forth. And so this is a side-by-side -side comparison of three generation of 700 megahertz magnets, where you can see that the latest generation of Ascend consumes actually one quarter of what the first generation of um, ultra shield magnets uh, consumed. And here it's a more <clears throat> broader picture here. You can see here at various frequency ranges, various magnet types, the previous generation of magnets, how much they consumed in milliliters per hour, the new generation, and you can see the savings and um, in, in cryogen consumption, it's much more modest than 400 and 500, but as soon as you reach 600, you can see a significant um, improvement in consumption. And then for ultra high field, the, uh, the savings is even, even, even larger, but this is not only because the magnets are more compact. And of course they have less cryostat size with a smaller heat radiation surface and uh, the heat transfer is less because the, the, the tubes are not as thick to support uh, less load, but because of the ability to change the technology from two Kelvin subcooled to four Kelvin at 800. That happened about uh, nine years ago in 2013, if I'm not mistaken. And now just a few weeks ago at ENC, we um, announced a work in progress, a new one gigahertz working at 4.2 Kelvin with 68% um, less helium than the previous generation of the one gigahertz. So another way that um, we wanted to explain how we, you know, as a magnet designers and the supplier, how we can help the community with new products that consume less and help this overall crisis and problems. We have. And going back to the miniature recovery system, it is a compact system, but it's important to know that it was optimized and validated for use with NMR magnets to maintain the safety and eliminate spectral artifacts. Uh, the installation is included. And um, as I mentioned earlier, the recovery is only for the boil off only for the nominal boil off so 80 to 85 percent um, so that means the liquefaction needs to be done elsewhere as we heard from phil and uh, from craig finding ways finding other uh, labs that have liquefiers is it's a very good idea so they can advantage for instance on a university campus at physics departments they usually have uh, such liquefiers or another large nmr lab also trading in with the supplier, the helium gas, and uh, we started discussion or we heard other, other customers starting discussion with the suppliers, not getting positive answers yet, but I, we believe is also depending on the location because if the helium supplier has a liquefier at a very different location, of course, uh, they may not be opening to that idea, but if let's say the labs are closer where they have the liqu liquefaction stations, they may be um, they may be supporting this. Um, storing the helium gas in this uh, in this high pressure cylinders, so we would supply um, as an option a batch of twelve cylinders. So this bundle of twelve cylinders would store 
uh, gas that it's equivalent to 125 liters of liquid helium, which is uh, more than needed, for instance, for um, one year of one of 400 megahertz NMR, for instance. And um, very important to note that you know the transportation party doing this has to, has to follow the regulations as we heard before. Not only the suppliers, but there are other parties out there that have licenses to do this. And in this sense, um, of course, Craig and Phil would be much better to be consulted on this, but I just did myself a Google search for the regulations for cryogenic transport, Department of Transportation. And um, you can see there are different title regulations for transporting pressurized gas compared to transporting uh, liquids cryogens, okay? And of course, this is only, I assume, this is for federal regulations for United States and in various countries around the world, there could be different regulations in Europe. Maybe each country has their own regulation for transport. Uh, the, the miniature recovery system has an internal he helium storage bag, a three-stage high-pressure compressor, electronic unit with the color display, the relief valves, the, the filter unit, and condensate drain. It comes with 50 meter of flexible tubing for recovery. Uh, if you have three, four systems, depending where they are, additional um, could be provided, additional tubing can be provided. Um, there is a connection from the high pressure gas cylinder to the, to the unit of 10 meter. And the rack that I mentioned earlier, it's optional. Some customers could provide this on their own. 12 cylinders in the US translate to about 125. I know in Europe, uh, there are 50, liter, 50 liters, so it's uh, 150 a total of liquid helium for a batch of 12 cylinders. <clears throat> and uh, this is a couple of pictures of uh, the demonstration and testing lab uh, that we had for this uh, HelioSmart um, at our department in uh, Fallenden in Switzerland. You can see here um, the picture of a 400 with the HelioSmart right by the lab. The testing lab had two, three systems, one 400 and two 600. Uh, you see the batch of a bundle of 12 cylinders, but more importantly, you see here the, um, the table with the NMR workstation, because this was a validation lab, right? So it's important to note that uh, during the uh, operation of this um, Helium Smart, there was no impact on the NMR test. And very important to note that the compressor is in a passive mode most of the time. It only turns on when the, when the storage bag is full and the gas needs to be compressed. So in our case, with those three magnets that we mentioned earlier, um, the system was in passive mode for about 11 hours at a time. And then the, after 11 hours, the bag was full and the compressor will turn on. And the compressor will stay on only for 10 minutes, which will be the time to compress um, into, the, into, into, the, into the cylinders. So you can see here how after 10 minutes, another cycle of 11 hours of passive mode. And after that, another, another uh, 10 minutes of period of compressor running. The power drawn is very small by the compressor for just those 10 minutes. And this is a uh, last slide on this topic is you see here the footprint of the system is relatively small 1.4 meter by 0.85 meter. Um, and the, the compressor speed is listed here. That's why it runs 10 minutes and it's air cooled. The system is air cooled and uh, it, it requires minimal maintenance with uh, just an oil level check and the constant and drain. It is certified hardware to connect this Helio Smart and NMR magnets included with the system, with the installation, and uh, with a note that optimization validation for using NMR lab safely with our spectral artifacts was carried out at our <clears throat> test lab in, in Fallon. And <clears throat> now, what would be our next option? If let's say you don't have recovery, you get into a difficulty situation, you don't have, as Nancy mentioned, earlier, um, Brooker, when possible, is able to respond to some of these requests and help you out. But we cannot guarantee. So basically, uh, our request is before you make a decision to de-energize the magnet because of not having a recovery system or not having helium supply, please do reach out to our Brooker uh, Territory SLS Manager to inquire of a 
the possibility of a refill service or a refill service contract. We cannot sell helium if we have it, but we can we can provide a service with the helium. Um, given this price, of course, we cannot guarantee, but we have we were able in the last uh, year or so to help uh, several of our customers in, in, in case of a crisis. It will depend basically now on a mask because we are also on allocation. It will depend on the plant utilization of our broker him allocation for that particular month and how much spare we have left. So do please reach out um, as needed. Now, and if there is absolutely no option left and the magnet must be de-energized, right? Uh, the message, and I think uh, John would, would, uh, would join me here in, in confirming this, that please do engage a specialized magnet and MR system engineer to safely uh, do this for both the safety of the personnel, but also for the instrument. Um, you know, so um, ourselves and other vendor for magnet service, you know, would bring the equipment needed to do this and will do the service. And why is it so important to, to do this safely? Um, you see here in this picture on the right, you see the cross section of a magnet with a magnet coil and the joints at the top of the, of the, of the coil. So the joints is very important. They are always in liquid helium. On the left side is an example of a chart of helium uh, percentages versus the height of the cryostat or the, the geometry of the coil for a 400 in this case. So during the normal operation for a 400, you know, the helium can be allowed to reach low levels of 13 or so percent. But during energization, the level is like 75% minimum recommended. Also during the energization, the same. Otherwise, if you don't have enough helium there to cover the joints, enough heat from the current lead could affect those joints through hotspot uh, transfer of heat to those joints that basically would damage the joints. As you see here, this power supply, right? Connected to your rod that goes into the magnet, the rod connects into the connector uh, at the top plate there. Um, and you, you will have joints there actually between the persistent switch, right? And the coil itself. So these joints actually could easily be damaged in case they don't have enough cooling from the helium. So the message is here is you, you should always make sure that the level of helium is um, above the minimum required for energization or deenergization. And also during normal operation, they should always be above the minimum level. And in case of if you must de-energize, please do engage a specialized engineer to do that. And <clears throat> now, if we go to this particular magnet of 400 megahertz, if we look at the numbers, we wanted to emphasize what could a very small volume of helium really do? Because we heard from Phil before, one could really maybe try to find some spot helium on the market, even a higher cost, or to get some gases and take it to a liquefier just to, to, to um, resolve a crisis. Um, so for a 400 example here, the yield consumption is 114 liters. So the refill volume um, every 300 days is 94 liters, right? Uh, so what does this mean? It means that even that you don't have to add all 94 liters, if you just add, for instance, 50 liters because of the small consumption, this will extend your operation with just 50 liters for more than five months. So this would pretty much buy time, buy you time to explore a helium recovery solution, for instance, because like we heard, those recovery systems are not available um, in, on the shelf with the supply and the chain, chain and so on. It takes longer, a longer time to do it. But this solution to look for, for helium in case of a crisis, just to keep the magnets operational, would prevent the alternative of deregulating the magnet which will mean later on when you have to recool it and re-energizing a much higher expense in terms of helium. So you need 80 liters you know, to de-energize safely to, to not avoid a, a magnet um, um, damage. And then later on for a 400, you will need 500 liters to recool and re-energize. So this will translate in 580 liters, which will mean five years of the normal operation of, uh, you know, of helium consumption. 
in a graphical mode if I were to present this. So you can see here the magnet denarization will require already an 80 liters there to keep it to keep the level above minimum for denarization. And then later on, let's say in four years from, from that time, you, you get helium and then you can bring the magnet back, back, recool it and bring it back to life and re-energize it. So that will require another 500 liters. So already 580, right? Well, if you can find some helium, right? Uh, in the meantime, you can keep on consuming very little you know, per day or per year. And you can see here that uh, it will take about five over five years right to to look at you know the amount of helium that you would spend through this option <clears throat> compared to keeping the magnet operational and then of course beyond that after you de-energize it here you continue with the normal boiler so we wanted to show this also in a graphical way to to give you ideas to think about as a complement to what also we heard before from uh craig and phil of the potential options there to find some helium gas or liquid helium, a small volume uh, at, at the spot market prices. And I think that was my last slide. I want to thank again uh, the organizing uh, committee and you for your attention as well. And also my colleagues at Brooker. It was a group that really helped me with input for these slides, including Patrick Bickles, Daniel Bauman, Justin Mobley, Wurst Meyer, Clemens Anklin, and Reiner Kumule. And uh, <clears throat> I think that was my last slide. Ken, back to you. All right, thank you very much. I have to say that uh, <clears throat> when I put my recovery system in my lab last year, uh, and this is something you may want to consider if you're thinking about it, the vendors who provide these things, uh, especially quantum design and cryomech, did not provide any information on how to connect that system to your magnets. So that's something that I had to um, pull together from you know people in the industry, people in the NMR community to help me kind of piece all that together. So the resources that you've provided in this slide are really tremendously helpful from that, from that side of connecting your magnets uh, to any recovery system. So thank you for that. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, I forgot to mention this earlier, is that there was an email circulated by the American Chemical Society uh, they are pushing uh, new legislation that's in Congress now to conserve helium. Um, and I think if you're a member of the ACS, I'm sure you've received this email. It's basically one of those automated forms where you just put your name and address in there, and it will automatically email your congressmen and your senators in the area to, to help for that. So I think that's an important thing. I don't know if... Uh, if Craig is familiar with that uh, email that went out from the S ACS, but I think that's also an important step uh, is to get our government a little more interested in helium con conservation. Um, um, I don't know much about that initiative. The rest of ACS is a little bit separate from CNN, um, but I've, I've heard about it. I think you should sign up. I know that some, there is some interest in the US Senate uh, Senator Barrasso from Wyoming, and there are a couple other people that are talking about helium in Congress now. So it's not, you know, you're not shouting in the wind here. There are people that are looking at these issues from a federal policy standpoint. So I would encourage people to participate in that kind of a thing. Yeah, I, I would just add that helium was removed from the 2021 critical minerals list, which was uh, kind of a dopey uh, move by the uh, government who really don't understand how the business works. Uh, and that is a very recent thing. And yes, uh, Senator Barrasso and his staff are have been trying to reverse that decision. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was a really uh, weak decision made by folks who really don't understand what the, the how the business works. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so I think it's impressive that we still have uh, over 250 people watching this presentation here an hour and 40 minutes. Uh, from the beginning. Uh, we only have a little bit more to present, and then we will answer as many questions as we can. I want to thank, there's been a lot of questions in the chat, so I want to thank uh, all the people who are just uh, taking it upon themselves to answer those questions as they come on, because I just don't think we're going to be able to get to every single one of them. Um, well, I'm not going to be able to start back at the beginning of the list anyways, but uh, so let me go ahead and pull up these next few slides. Uh, Rosman covered 
a lot of this in his talk just recently. But uh, I think what a lot of people who are here today are really concerned about is, uh, you know, what, what are they going to do if they simply cannot get helium? And uh, the issue that, that everyone's running into that he mentioned is that if you even do want to take the step to de-energize your magnet, you need to be at somewhere around 80% full uh, of helium. And usually, I would imagine if you're a small lab and you're suddenly told that you are not going to be able to get helium for two or three months, you're probably near empty. So what do you do in those situations? Well, let me start by saying that we're just going to provide some information here about some options, educate you on the, on the, on the very rough basics of this. And neither Ivan or MR Resources or Brooker or anyone involved with this uh, talk here is is going to be responsible for what you do with this information. Um, but, and, and it's really critical. All of this is, is dangerous technical work that should be done by a magnet expert, if at all possible. Um, let me go ahead and move to the next slide here. <clears throat> so uh, Rosvin also mentioned your magnet book. So I don't know how many of you, I'm sure most of you who have been in the NMR field a long time are, are very familiar with your magnet book, but maybe not everyone is. The magnet book is an absolutely vital resource. Uh, it's at, the, at a minimum, it provides that table that he showed that shows you how low your magnet can go. Uh, you may be surprised how low your magnet can go. Uh, we usually fill, because we have seven magnets here at Virginia Tech, we usually fill them when they're maybe 20% low, and we just fill, top all of them off. Um, and we've never even approached what is really the, the, the recommended fill volume. Uh, but this is also going to give you other information about the, the total volume of cryogens inside of your magnet. And it also has some information that was uh, collected when your magnet was brought up to field, which is gonna be a critical resource for engineers if they do come to uh, service your magnet or de-energize it. Uh, so if you don't know where your magnet book is, uh, I highly encourage you to find that. Um, uh, John or, or Rosvin, do you wanna comment on any of this part so far? Well, uh, Rosvan pointed out uh, very importantly that, and you are uh, as well, Ken, that uh, don't 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 try this yourself. I mean, it, it's very very difficult. Uh, uh, it's also going to be a double-edged sword uh, in terms of if you can't get helium. Well, how are we going to uh, discharge the magnet safely to begin with? Uh, Rosman pointed out a little bit earlier that uh, uh, they're doing a, a, a bit of a offering a fill service, uh, including helium, that uh, might also be extended, I suppose. Uh, Rosvan could answer better, but uh, maybe extended, uh, I suppose, to uh, uh, folks that would uh, purchase this fill service uh, to, uh, in, in order to simply have the magnet uh, de-energized. Uh, we at MR Resources, uh, we're able to get uh, some small additional supplies here and there uh, that also could be used for the purpose of uh, uh, coming in and uh, discharging a magnet. Uh, but again, uh, it, you know, unless you're in a situation uh, as uh, Nancy is at uh, PNNL and you have qualified engineers uh, on site, uh, you know, you're, you're very potentially going to be opening up a, a, a big can of worms and maybe a uh, very dangerous can of worms uh, in, in attempting to uh, uh, perform a discharge uh, on your own. Yeah. Um, so what, what exactly are we talking about uh, de-energizing a magnet? Um, and I, I am no expert on magnets. So I, I'm just sort of introducing these to topics so that the experts can comment on them. But I think what we're really looking at here is sort of a controlled uh, release of energy from the magnets to a state that it can uh, survive without helium. Um, and usually you only do this, I assume you're only doing this when you're going to move a magnet. Are there any other cases when you might want to do this? I 
It doesn't sound like it. Um, and again, as, as John and Rosman mentioned, this should only be done by a, a trained magnet expert, not only because of the skills involved, but this requires some very specialized hardware, uh, charging rods for your magnet. Those are not always available for uh, in your lab for all of the magnets you have. And then uh, some electronic equipment like power supplies and whatnot. Um, so the risks, as they've already mentioned, um, are that if this is done improperly, or even if it's done by a trained professional, there's always a risk that your magnet may not come back to field. And as I understand it, the only way to find out if your magnet is going to come back is to spend the money to put the 500 liters of helium back in it to cool it and attempt to bring it back to field. There's no way to know uh, ahead of time if, if that magnet is going to come back. And this risk substantially increases at higher fields over 400 and 500 megahertz. Uh, and of course, we've also talked about uh, this also needs to be performed in the magnet is nearly full of helium. Um, so any any more comments on those, Nancy or John or Russell? Yeah, can, can I, I, I would add to that, that, uh, well, firstly, uh, you know, magnet, uh, uh, you know, might also be uh, uh, routinely discharged uh, with, uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, helium boil off is uh, uh, increasing and uh, maybe O-ring seals need to be redone. Uh, that sort of thing. But uh, on this uh, current, uh, current slide that you're showing uh, that, sure, there, there is always risk of, uh, uh, you know, you bring a magnet down uh, by the book, as they say, in a uh, very controlled fashion uh, that, I mean, there's always risk that uh, something's going to go wrong and uh, it may not be uh, able to be restored uh, at uh, a later date. But uh, that said, that risk of bringing the magnet down in a controlled fashion uh, is certainly going to be far less hazardous uh, than uh, letting a magnet quench. And uh, as you point out on the slide here, that uh, uh, essentially the higher the field uh, uh, during a quench or, or when a quench occurs, uh, the more risk uh, you run of uh, something going wrong, uh, uh, a coil burning, uh, uh, a joint burning, uh, part of the switch, uh, as the case may be, and uh, you know, lastly, you're you're in in, in either situation, you're not going to know if that magnet uh, uh, is going to come back to field unless you 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 expend uh, uh, or, or go through the expense of helium uh, and charge it. And even if it makes it to field, uh, is the uh, uh, it is the drift rate uh, going to be suitable uh, at the end of the day? So uh, yeah, a lot of risks, a lot of questions uh, uh, to uh, consider here. I just want to chime in on pump magnets. So those that are, you know, sub four Kelvin, under no circumstances, uh, if at all possible, should anyone uh, even consider letting those quench? I mean, these are much more complicated systems. And I know that there's probably plenty of the people in the community that have Varian pumped magnets, because we have one. And it, it's a helium hog, right? It's 12 years old on average, you know, integrated over the year per, on a per month basis, it's about 250 liters per month, something like that. And we're kind of stuck. I mean, we, we have to keep it up. There's not really much of an alternative. Um, and so, uh, I mean, you just can't take a risk because those pump magnets are expensive and they're fundamentally pretty much irreplaceable unless you have the, the resources to go to Bruker and buy a whole new system. Yeah, um, that's an excellent point. I have not even seen one of those. I'm, I'm somewhat glad I don't have one. Um, Ken, one, one comment from my end would yeah. be, um, I think everyone should is aware that a, a dry quench, if you don't refill the magnet to keep the level of helium above the helium level, a dry quench is not healthy. So all magnets have quench protection system. Those quench protection systems are designed to withstand uh, uh, qu quenches, but uh, when the helium level, of course, is 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 above the minimum level, if 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 the level is 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 below, the chances of damage of of, of, of a magnet is extremely high. So I I do I do align with what John mentioned earlier that there's always a risk that the magnet will not come 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 back. Right, uh, the, the likelihood is 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 it's small as long as everything was done properly. 
uh, but there's always that chance. That's why even in our service contracts and so on, we always have to have a disclaimer there for liability reasons. But otherwise, if the engineer has done a good job, uh, a magnet should should be able to come back, right? Um, it's not, nothing is 100% sure with, when we talk about um, superconductivity and going down to this fine details inside the magnet, but the likelihood is very high that it will, it will come back. Uh, the, the message is do not let the magnets go down in helium level um, below the minimum allowed level. Do not let them uh, dry quench. <clears throat> okay, uh, so let's let's move on to the topic of, of quenching and just what that is. Um, this, this is basically an uncontrolled rapid dissipation of the energy from your magnet. And uh, Usually this happens sort of accidentally as a result of magnet age or maintenance issues. Um, and this is really only ever done intentionally when there are no plans to bring that magnet back to field. Um, this is not a way to, to feel any comfort in that your magnet might be able to come back. Um, so the risks of a magnet quench are more substantial than that in a de-energization because you're going to rapidly dissipate all of the cryogens in your magnet, which could displace oxygen in the room. Um, and then an, another issue that I think is somewhat what you're talking about where magnets aren't uh, designed for the volume being less than that min minimal level is uh, cryopumping. And maybe you guys can go into a little bit of just what cryopumping is. Yeah, so so um, <clears throat> I think Ken, the cryopumping that we discussed earlier was, you know, it, it can happen on any magnet. If for instance, the magnet is left open, uh, you can get contamination in and, you know, every time when you open the magnet to, to for instance, do a fill, you know, um, contamination air can get in. And then that usually uh, leads to some ice at the beginning and the next field, the ice is, is growing and growing and growing. So there's always a risk of cryopumping and bringing contamination in that can lead to a dangerous situation of, of a blockage there, right? So now if, if you have a blockage and you may not know about this, let's say you still have some flow out of the magnet, but there is there's a blockage there. Uh, one could imagine in case of a quench, uh, how dangerous it is because basically in case of a quench, you have the magnet energy that's gonna be dissipated into the uh, magnet uh, coil assembly and the helium uh, surrounding the magnet, creating a huge pressure, right? The gas is gonna try to come out of there. And then um, what, what will happen is if you have a blockage, then you create you know, a mini bump, so to speak, and of course, newer magnets have uh, pressure, uh, I mean, uh, drop up plates to prevent um, something really uh, serious to happen. But some, there are some older magnets out there that may not have drop up plates. So always, you know, uh, uh, quenching magnets um, forcefully, for instance, if you, even that you, you, are, you are to decommission a magnet, even, even that it is gonna be scrapped, right? Because let's say it's a very old magnet, you, 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 you don't wanna have the resources to keep that operation for some reason, and you have to strap it, you know, that's it. Even then, we do strongly recommend to, to engage a magnet specialist for that, to do that safely. And that's only a very short period of time. We are talking about um, less than a one day of service. And uh, I spoke with John, John earlier, and he, he also agreed. It's, it's, it's a simple matter, but for someone specialized to prevent an accident. Mm -hmm. And is that something that Brooker will do for other vendor systems or will Brooker only uh, quench their own systems? So Brooker, Brooker has historically sold uh, other brands of magnets, as you all know. So we, we have sold many Oxford magnets before and um, we, we had um, 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 an OEM contract with Magnax for a long time. So we have many Brooker systems out there with Magnax magnets, not just Brooker manufacturer magnet. But now if, if you are mentioning, for instance, subcooled uh, two Kelvin Oxford magnets, uh, uh, you know, or, or, um, or Magnax variant magnets, subcooled very complex magnets, 
it will be a different story that has to be discussed case by case because we don't have that experience with with those magnets we did upgrade some console on some of those ultra high field magnets but not really working on the magnets themselves other other magnets oxford magnets at, at lower field 400 to 600 uh, we we know them rather well right rosvan i'll point out that uh, uh, very fortunately uh, mr resources has access uh, to some of the uh, former uh, Varian uh, slash Magnex uh, factory personnel, uh, magnet engineers, and so forth, and uh, you know, so we we can certainly assist uh, with uh, uh, some of those uh, uh, brands as well. Um, well, thank you, guys. I guess the last point on the slide is is just that it, if you have a quench, if you purposely quench your magnet. Uh, you should not expect it to come back. Uh, this is not an alternative shortcut, a cheaper way to get around de-energizing a system if you hope to get it back. Although, from what I understand, uh, you, you know, magnets do come back from quenches, um, but it's uh, somewhat unpredictable. And um, of course, our favorite uh, magnet engineers are, are MR Resources and, and Brooker. But there are a lot of independent contractors that may be closer to you who can also assist with these issues, especially if we get to a situation where uh, a lot of people are having to deal with questions like these. Uh, there are a lot of vendors who are potentially available to help you with these things. So always consider those options before you ever consider trying something that, like this yourself. Um, so that's the end of that slide. I think at this point, let me... Uh, give uh, John, Nancy, and Rosvan an opportunity to make any last um, last comments on this topic before we go to questions from the audience. Can, can I'll uh, go back to uh, Phil at this point and uh, hopefully that, you know, although we are in the midst of uh, uh, quite a bad uh, problem uh, for uh, many, if, if not most in the industry, as I mentioned uh, uh, during my opening remarks, uh, let's hope Phil is uh, uh, on, on track and correct that uh, uh, things might loosen up uh, a bit more uh, uh, in the second half of 2022. And uh, I would agree that I don't think we're going to see prices come down uh, anytime soon. Uh, again, Phil has a uh, better handle on those things than I do, but uh, uh, I think there's, well, let's, there, there's a lot of hope for the best here. But there's certainly been a lot of things presented today that uh, sort of uh, bring us down to earth, uh, uh, to reality in terms of what can perhaps be done to uh, uh, look at uh, some creative things to uh, uh, find liquid helium supply. And uh, also from the uh, uh, sort of hardware perspective of the magnets, uh, what should and shouldn't be done uh, uh, with regard to uh, uh, allowing a magnet to uh, dry quench versus, uh, uh, you know, just scrambling around trying to get some helium supply so that it, it uh, can be discharged in a uh, uh, controlled fashion. Nancy, did you have something else? I do not, but um, I'm certainly open if anybody had any very specific questions, you could ask them now or just email me. Um, so there have been a lot of questions that have come up in the chat. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if uh, some of our panelists have had an opportunity to monitor those and to perhaps present some of those to us. Uh, also, let me offer any, any audience members who are still here, please feel free to unmute your microphone and ask your questions live at this time. Uh, uh, can uh, drop-off plates were mentioned by uh, Razvan, uh, or, or la I should say lack of drop-off plates, uh, and this uh, equates to uh, something I'm looking at uh, in the chat right now. Uh, if you do have older magnets, uh, and I'm talking you know, specifically very, very old, uh, 25, 30, 35 years, uh, and yeah, I think there's, there, there's still some of the, the, those vintages uh, in operation. Uh, have a look and uh, see if they do either have the drop off, uh, drop off plates uh, or in the case of uh, some of the uh, older Oxford magnets, uh, they uh, came up with a scheme of uh, the, the, the bolts 
that uh, connect the uh, 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 the bottom flange to the bottom of the cryostat, uh, uh, you would notice uh, a, a safety uh, scheme that was uh, come up with uh, quite a number of years ago is the uh, the bolts would actually be backed off, uh, loosened up again a, a little bit, if you will, and they would have some uh, uh, sort of uh, foam rubber material that uh, would actually, uh, if if something were to go terribly wrong, uh, would actually allow the uh, the cryostat to lift uh, slightly from the uh, the base plate and uh, release pressure. But again, my my point is, uh, if you if you uh, do have any uh, extremely old, uh, extremely old maggots on hand? Uh, probably a good idea to determine uh, ASAP if they do have the uh, proper safety devices installed. Uh, if not, uh, uh, either keep them filled with helium or get them discharged. Okay, thank you. Uh, does uh, has anyone seen questions that they wanted to comment on on the in the chat? And again, please, if you're in the audience and you have a question, please, this is this is your chance to uh, to shine and be famous. I have a question to Mr. Tiot Rasko. If you could tell us something about the electric connections of the Helios mod, what is necessary? In terms Anything of electricity? Special? Hmm? Electricity? Electricity, I'm sorry. Yes, connection. If you need something special, three phase or just a normal 220 volt connection for it's Europe. Just, yeah, correct. So we can send to the document, technical document, Erika. So we have a version for Europe and a version for North America, Europe and, and other countries, mm -hmm. of course, worldwide, and a version for 60 Hertz for America, correct. So, but there's normal connection, single phase, no three phase. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I do see a new question from Darcy Burns. Uh, it says, when siting recovery units, when space is an issue, uh, are ground vibrations from the compressors an issue with respect to artifacts and noise in the NMR system? And is there a minimum distance to site the compressors with respect to magnets, not uh, withstanding stray fields? Yeah, so uh, we showed a, a, a few slides. Um, in our lab, how we had the actual recovery system with the compressor right by a magnet, right? So uh, we were able to validate uh, the NMR performance in, in that condition. But I personally visited many labs that have the full recovery and liquefaction systems. And um, you know, one of them that comes into my mind is uh, the uh, CCRC at the University of Georgia in Athens. Um, another one at the University of Wisconsin, they do have the actual systems in the large labs. So they are not very far actually uh, from, uh, from the NMR. In uh, Georgia, I believe the compressor is on the outside of the wall. So it's kind of in a shed open semi area there. Uh, but um, we, we demonstrated with this compressor, we can have them in the, in the NMR lab. And especially for recovery only, it only turns on for, for a very short time. But even during that time, we were able to look at the data, NMR data, to, to validate that it's okay. okay thank you. Uh, I have another question here from um, Raymond Burt Clark. Uh, I think this might be a good question for Phil. Uh, how do you avoid suppliers that are trying to price gouge? And there's probably not a good answer here. Uh, no, there is a good answer. Okay. And the, uh, and I answered it actually on, on the chat, but uh, very briefly. So, you know, what, the way you avoid getting price gouged is you, is you have to be smart when you sign the original contract. And, um, you know, ba what you want to try to do, and it, again, you know, it's very difficult to negotiate a, uh, a good contract when there's a seller's market or frankly, no market, because right now most of the suppliers can't take on new business. But, uh, you know, the, the uh, standard agreements that the industrial gas companies use um, have a, a clause called, um, well, the price adjustment clause uh, has open, it's what it's called open escalation. And it has, most of your contracts probably have a similar clause. It says from time to time, the supplier has the right to adjust prices here under by sending you a notice. And when you get that notice, you have so many days to shop 
for a, a third party quote. And if it's lower than the adjusted price, then your incumbent supplier has the option to roll back his increase or match the third party price, whichever is higher. It's an absolutely no risk provision for the supplier. And it's open-ended. And at a time like now, when there's a, a shortage and everybody's allocating, you're not even gonna be able to get a third party quote. <clears throat> so if you agree to that language, you have given your supplier price, carte blanche to raise your price uh, whenever he wants by as much as he wants. So the, the, the key to not getting price gouged is to, uh, is to, is to take, to spend the extra effort on modifying the price adjustment language in the contract so that you are protected in some way, you, you know, and, and uh, I'm not saying it's easy to do, but that's where it happens. It's a, uh, you, you need to try to negotiate caps or maybe price adjustments that are indexed to some third party index or, or um, uh, limit price adjustments to once a year or, you know, any, any guardrails you can put on that paragraph so that you are not totally exposed to price increases. So that's my long-winded answer, but you know. That's a good answer. Probably not a lot can be done in the immediate term if you already have a contract or no Correct. contract. Correct. Um, let's see. So there was a question about uh, emailing the link to this recording. Uh, these recordings go on to the MR Resources YouTube channel. Um, I'm not sure how quickly they go up there, but they will go up there uh, as quickly as possible and they're open and available to everyone at that time. Typically a, a week or so, uh, Ken. Yeah, I think there's uh, some- just, just a quick note with that, uh, this is extremely important. Uh, I am going to work my best to get that done by the end of, by midnight tomorrow night. So it would be up on Saturday morning. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Eric has his work cut out for him to make me look more attractive than the final product. Um, let's see. So I'm just going to go ahead and open it up audience again for any final questions. Uh, if you want to type those either into the chat or um, uh, mention them out loud. There is one question that's coming here. Uh, it says, is the producer price index the best benchmark for price increases? And I guess I would take that one. Uh, the, uh, you know, frankly, uh, there, there are not really good um, publicly available indices, but, uh, you know, a lot of people use the CPI uh, and uh, of course, the CPI was uh, <laughs> barely moving for years. Now the CPI is going up uh, kind of eight percentish year on year, so it, it's uh, not a, a great index that way. But it, it's an index that has nothing to do with the helium market. Um, in a perfect world, and this is something that only a big user could negotiate. Uh, but in a perfect world, you'd like something that is a market-based index. And a market-based index would be either based on the supplier's cost of, of uh, ob obtaining helium, whether he's buying it or producing it, or his selling prices to his entire customer base. Uh, you know, the I idea of one of those indices is at least you're staying aligned with the market in some way. And, uh, you know, if the whole market goes up, well, your price probably should go up too. If the whole market goes down, you'd like to also see a, uh, a decrease. So, you know, I, I would say for someone on this call, uh, again, if they're, a, if they're a big enough uh, customer to have a little bit of stroke, uh, that, you know, being in, uh, indexed to the supplier's third, uh, third party selling prices would be a very, very nice thing that would provide you some protection. Um, here's a question for Rosvan. Uh, what material uh, do you use for the uh, 50 meters of the Helio Start uh, recovery line? Oh, I have to be honest, I don't know the exact uh, uh, kind of uh, code for the material, but we can ask um, our developers in Europe 
what they picked up, but I know they have tried various materials to decide on what made most sense in terms of the efficiency recovery so there are no leakages and so forth. So um, I, I'm sorry, but I don't know the answer. I will check with our developers and, uh, and confirm. I can comment that we've used uh, silicon tubing on our, on our system and I have not uh, witnessed any leakages at least at that point. I did learn I'm not very good with Teflon tape, but I fixed those issues as well. Um, any other questions? Ken, a uh, final uh, thought from my side is that uh, my understanding, uh, uh, this is regarding uh, uh, helium supply once again, my understanding that uh, clinical MRI systems uh, are taking very, very high priority uh, in the uh, liquid helium supply chain uh, uh, during this situation. And uh, I might suggest that uh, folks uh, might want to reach out to uh, any of their uh, acquaintances or friends uh, in the uh, uh, clinical MRI arena that, uh, do, do you have any extra this month? And uh, you might uh, uh, find some success uh, with, with that, for example. Yeah, that does uh, remind me of questions that came up earlier about uh, our MRIs um, sort of at the same risk as NMRs, and uh, they certainly are. I think that a, a lot of modern MRIs, if I understand this correctly, have, have built-in recovery systems, however, so that they are not, uh, not filling 100 liters a, a month. They're supplementing their helium with uh, with with eating gas, I guess, into a recovery system. Actually, can I can comment on this? So uh, yeah, both clinical MRIs these days, I mean, for a long time, as well as preclinical. So we supply uh, to the preclinical market MRIs. They're all refriger actively refrigerated. So they have coal heads and compressors. So uh, not under normal operation, there is zero boil off. There's no consumption. Um, but in terms of um, some losses that are minimal during services because every two years there is a service day on the coal head. When the service occurs, then the compressor needs to be stopped for the service. And then there is some minimal loss, which is usually replenished during that service. So yes, so the MRI systems are generally much less affected the way we know. And also there are shipped coal from, at least our systems uh, for MRI preclinical, there are shipped coal from the factory. So basically, um, there's no, because a lot of volume is needed to cool a magnet, right, from room temperature to helium temperature during the installation. But in the case of pre-cooling MRIs, they are shipped coal from the factory. Uh, so there's no, no need at the customer side other than refilling it. And usually the vendor, in our case, Brooker, when we supply one, we refill the, the helium losses during transit because there is losses during transit, during the week transit from Europe to the customer, if it's, let's say, intercontinental, then um, there is gonna be some losses there. Well, it'd be nice if, uh, if we could get to that point for NMRs, but I guess that's what our recovery systems are doing for us. Yeah, you may remember, Ken, uh, we introduced the um, Eon magnets um, some years ago. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we still have the technology. The issue is that when you have one of those compressor and whole coal heads for one magnet, right? It is rather um, you know, expensive to keep the operations because of the maintenance required and so forth. It's not out of the question if you have one system, but when you have multiple systems, right? It does make sense to have a, a recovery system that can, can uh, help you know, the multiple magnets. With MRI magnets, I would say um, they all come by default and the medical community already accepted those, the, the, the uh, technology for the active refrigeration um, system. So it, it's, and also the consumption there is much larger uh, than, than the NMR magnets. The NMR magnets consume so much less than MRIs. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Ken, of course, uh, uh, this is uh, clearly a little bit further out in the future, but uh, there's always the, uh, prospect uh, with regard to, uh, high, well, any, any uh, uh, NMR or MRI magnet, uh, always the prospect of uh, uh, high TC uh, superconductors. Uh, but uh, again, that's uh, quite a ways out and certainly a, 
uh, topic in and of itself for uh, another day, perhaps. Yes, there's definitely a few questions about that. Those are those are obviously being uh, worked on, but I think we're a long ways from seeing that. Uh, if, if if you can solve that problem, you'll be a wealthy man, man or woman. Any other final questions? All right, I guess uh, Dave, you're back on. Okay, sure. So I guess if there are no questions, let me ask John if he has any final words. Well, you know, uh, great meeting today, folks. Uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, right up front, uh, obviously very important uh, subject matter. Uh, my hat is off to uh, Ken for uh, putting this all together. Uh, also, uh, our speakers, uh, Razvan, Craig, Phil, uh, Nancy. And uh, you've all done a very, very wonderful job with, uh, with, with this, uh, uh, well, rather uncomfortable uh, subject to deal with. I hope it was useful for everyone. And uh, well, uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today. Okay, thanks, John. And I guess if there are no more words, I'll, I will officially close the meeting. And I, of course, have our nice little gavel uh, that does that. Thank you. Thank you, Dave.